Hey, everyone. Who said hi just now? I didn't hear. Hi. hi. All right. Oh, great. Thank you. So today I'm going to share some exciting research that I've been doing, I don't know, for the greater part of the last six months, eight months, nine months, I don't know, most of this year. Not, th not that this is the only research I've done. This is just the most exciting stuff, the stuff that I want to blow your mind with right now. So... I had to cut out a lot of content from the talk, so I'm going to try to go through it quickly and add it back in without slides, because I don't think I'm going to make it. <coughs> Let me just take out my notes, just in case I get there, and then I need a refresher. All right. <sighs> hey, everyone. So, smart transactions. Sounds great. It is um, a prophecy of a new paradigm. It's basically a prophecy because it's not something like I decided. I'm not like imposing this on you guys. I'm like making a prediction that you're going to agree with me is like sort of a sound prediction. And then the only thing they might be imposing is accelerating the timeline, which is sort of maybe my fault if I'm accelerating it, but it's not my fault that's going to happen. This wasn't me. It's like a pair. I'm like the prophet here. It's I didn't do it. So here's the prophecy. Basically, Ethereum transactions will become smart, which means... Yeah, they're already programmable in network, but they're going to become context-aware in this way that's like characteristic of smart products. That like sort of like you should, you know, you go, you walk beside them, and then they start like breathing and like knowing what you're about to do, and you know, they sort of like act smart um, in, a, in a way that's sort of more than just programmable networks, but actually like they're they're reactive to their context. Um, and basically, that means sort of over their actual and possible futures in this context, and also over their uh, over like this this their context. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. But like today, relatively speaking, I'm going to say that transactions are dumb and blind. Basically, transactions today are not smart, and they will become smart. Uh, in the sense of like smart products, which is like a kind of a kind of research in product design, where you try to make products like yeah, programmable networked and reactive to their context in order to, you know, in order so that they act right depending on what's happening to them actually. So, basically, Ethereum is and has always already been uh, profoundly disrupted by unexpected semantics of the EVM, like solidity and the re-entrancy, or like just all sorts of weird quirks. You know, it takes a lot of time to become a solidity developer because of the weird ways that behave Ethereum behaves that you wouldn't think. And basically, this has come to a real, real head now with MEV, where sort of it's much very much not the expected transaction semantics. It's sort of like, it ends up being like the worst possible semantics that could be interpreted for that transaction. And sort of it, it ends up being kind of worst case execution, reintermediation, censorship, literally. Um, and this is actually putting all blockchain communities into crisis, into like a deep constitutional crisis. So like, what is a blockchain even? Like, what is a transaction? What does it mean? What does this transaction mean? Because like all the different possible ways it can be executed in a different context. Um, and so, especially what does it mean if it's not just sort of included in a block in this sort of natural, simple way that we were taught in the white paper, and like all the white papers even. So basically, transactions face an evolutionary pressure due to these changing circumstances, and they're basically like, in fact, de facto changing semantics, even though in some abstract computer science sense, like, oh, unless there's a new, unless there's a change to Ethereum and their semantics aren't changing. Actually, when people, when the transaction pool changes, when the way people order them and blocks changes, it changes, in fact, the transaction semantics. And so, and they're going to become aware, basically. At first, s slowly, and then, and then a lot. And any of you search awareness, basically, will start, and is starting out as a sort of really minor uh, little hacks, and is going to become sort of much more, much more aware. So basically, today, you know, you might pay out MEV in a favorable outcome. In the future, you'll be m much more actively and much less actively interacting with the search in order to get better performance and sort of a better even understanding of how your transaction is being treated during the transactions on validation. So that was the prophecy, basically. Like, because of this pr insane pressure by MEV, transactions are going to become smart. 
the semantics are going to be totally different than what we recognize today, because basically, um, well, I mean, I'll get to, I'll get to exactly like how and why that's like a secured prophecy and not like a speculation. So let's talk about the past. Like, how did we get here? So we have this um, this dark forest. Basically, we have uh, I call them ethereal predators in the dark forest because you don't always really know what happened and how this all went down. Um, worst case performance. Freak liquidation, stolen arbitrage, hijacked hacks. It's the stuff that we love to read about. Um, but also stuff that really hurts people when they transact financially. And just in terms of like, imagine you're trying to like be a white hat hacker and then like your white hat hacking gets hacked by some like front running bot. It's sort of dark. Um, and basically transactions went into hiding because of this. They, they avoid the mempool, they use trusted searchers. They, they basically try to eliminate their MEV in order to avoid this, this, this treatment. And, th and this is like what I consider to be sort of dumb behavior. I mean, it's a little bit smarter than getting wrecked right away, but it, it could be a lot smarter, really. Um, so, you know, we have also this concept of good MEV. Not all MEV is bad, right? Um, and I think this originated with MEV tips in bundles, but I wasn't around. So if someone could correct me later, that's great. Um, and, you know, so that's sort of distributed power from the, the sort of big bad miner who is supposed to take all the MEV to searchers who are supposed to be like sort of the good guys protecting your transactions and giving them the ability to influence the block outcome without just sort of this pure extractive politics. More like, you know, we pay for the thing to win as long as we win the auction, you know, and we're providing a good bundle, that's, that's good. And then there's also this sort of really, really, I mean, nascent kind of good MEV, which is like the saving and out of gas exceptions which is sort of like a really classic thing that like MEV was sort of built for from the start, where basically like sort of the space really was for traders who were getting wrecked in this uh, uh, gas price auction. And so the like, gas price auction became MEV, and then there was like good MEV and bad MEV as people sort of, you know, exploited and also tried to defend themselves and use it as a, as a sort of lever. Um, and basically, um, you know, I really have to power through here. So basically, you know, I, I sort of um, uh, picked up on this research um, this, this year, I, I, ran, I got, into the, uh, got into the MEV space, basically when I realized that there's this thing called MEV time, which is like sort of the time when the search is happening, when the, the time when the search for this like bundle or block is happening, where you can actually interact with Ethereum transactions in a sort of unconventional way. Uh, basically, rather than sort of only having um, you know, interactions with transactions, you can actually interact as the searcher with the transactions directly. Basically by, you know, the searchers have been adding their own transactions to bundles and interacting with them to like sort of take our profits in the normal way. Um, but sort of to directly interface with them via like an IO interface where you just like load values and they read values, um, really opens up the Ethereum transactions to uh, incredible sort of semantics by basically uh, letting you interrupt transaction flow do some stuff and then continue transaction flow as the searcher in a way where you can sort of update Oracle values many times within the trace of a transaction. You can do uh, all sorts of operations in the middle of a transaction and sort of in some way violating atomicity. But in some way it's not because it ultimately you still have the same you know, bundle of transactions, just that the bundle was set up in a way where the earlier transactions were put in as a function of like what happened in the middle of the other ones. So it's sort of really just the MEV time interaction with transactions really opens up non-deterministic semantics of the EVM. Now, instead of having like, you just literally have the EVM choose arbitrarily. And then like you're the, the searcher tells you what you chose and they have like an incentive if you tip them good to choose the right thing. And that actually um, not just lets you take advantage of these magic non-deterministic choices, but lets you have more information in the transaction than you, than you could before. You should literally just give them anything with like an Oracle uh, at MEV time during the middle of their transaction execution. And so this is actually um, a tremendous uh, change. But however, it's not really secure today because of the way that like bundles and like transactions can be reordered out of the, the search result that you find. So you imagine you like search for this amazing interaction with the smart contracts, sorry, ugh, with the smart transactions. Oh, excuse me. Oh. Um, uh, you, you, and, and, then, and then someone else jacks it and changes, uses different input values for the same transactions. And then you sort of get wrecked on your execution. Um, you know, basically like the search is not secure. That means that these MEV time interactions are not secure. Um, 
Uh, but if they can be secured, actually, um, uh, basically anything a searcher knows can be given to the transaction and they can use it. They can become aware of not just their execution on this trace, but all the other counterfactual timelines. They have many possible presents, futures, and pasts because that's sort of like what transactions are like before they're included in a block and finally actu actualize. So basically, you know, um, we have sort of with MEV time interactions, you can, transactions can become aware of like sort of this superposition of different possibilities and counterfactual traces that end up being very, very useful. Um, um, and, and, and basically, um, we need these we need these searches to be secure basically like like I was saying earlier and so basically I did a lot of research as a result into securing this this MEV search like how do we secure the search results so that it can't get jacked uh, that the transaction receipts can't change after you sort of like finish the search like those are the ones and they can't change um, thankfully I'm like happy to announce that I did succeed I'm not sharing the solution I'll share an outline um, and therefore uh, and therefore, I can make this prophecy very, very comfortably because basically, if it's competitive enough, viability is inevitability. Um, and basically, like it's like strictly dominant over over dumb transactions. It's possible. We can do it, and it's going to happen because like the the competitive pressure is too great. Uh, and so this sort of this argument, I like to say, underwrites my prophecy. Um, sort of signs off on it, um, and and basically. It's sort of, you have to take it for granted, or you have to believe me that I can secure the search. But if I can secure the search, I can do this MEV time interaction. I can inform the transactions of anything, basically. And then they can sort of do this crazy stuff uh, of like lots of like wild magic, which we'll get to very soon. So what is the state of the art in smart transactions today? Well, this is sort of the state of the art in my tech research. The economics and law and like other research has been sort of, uh, there's not enough time for, for all of it, unfortunately. Um, so basically, Smart transaction infrastructure is basically a story of smart transactions like pulling themselves up by the bootstraps using a little bit of awareness to get a little more awareness to try to get sort of, you know, uh, through a very secure basis, uh, a lot of awareness for the transactions. And so I split it up into phases that are designed to be sort of acceptable to our current normal trust model at first and then deviate a little bit only as necessary and then come back so that like is a minimally politically objective, uh, objectionable for everyone. So basically, in phase one, we save gas um, in this very classic way of like not doing those pesky out of gas transactions. In save one, and in phase one, sorry, um, we we have semi atomicity which means like you can execute the prefix of a bundle, can't choose the suffix or like anything that isn't a prefix. So it's like not not atomicity, but you can at least you, you sort of I can restrict using the EVM's rules only, sort of that you can only do a prefix I'm using this thing I call cumulative validation, sort of like a you know, it's, it's going to invalidate it if anything else invalidated. And also it's cumulative MEV too, sort of like says, stores up the MEV and then pays it only at the end of the bundle kind of, story, kind of story. Phase two is the interesting one that deviates from like the current trust model that people have, which is basically I'm saying like, oh, you know, we actually need to, like essential, it's essential that we trust the proposer for a moment. Just for a moment, just for like this phase two, we trust the proposer. And then in phase three, we remove the trust from the proposer by sort of locking down their commitments, making, it, making them like unable to screw us. So basically, in phase two, we sort of normally are very uncomfortable with because like the whole MEV space has been set up to defend you against the, and against the proposer. But I insist it's necessary. There's no way to do bundle protection without this. If you try to do it without the proposal, you won't be able to do it. The proposer is so important. He's, they're, the, they're, the, they're the signature on the block. They make it a block. You can't make a block without the proof of stake validator. It's just not a thing. Like they're important for building the block. There's no such thing as a block builder. It's not a proposer. No offense. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't even supposed to say that. I take it back. Um, Basically, the, today we sort of have this idea we don't trust the proposer, but we, we really got to. We really got to in order to get atomicity, full atomicity. And then we can lock it down and not trust them anymore in the next phase. And then after we have the, the atomicity of these, of these search results, basically, and like, sort of like the guaranteed like, full inclusion of them, like fully or whatever, um, then we can open it up to basically all sorts of smart contract development. Or sorry, smart, sorry ooh, again, oh, smart transaction development, and virtual, and, and the virtual services, which is a very cool concept of sort of to the MEV searcher, they're just extracting value from you. To you, you're getting a service from them. But sort of like, they're not a real service provider. They're just, they're extracting value from you from their perspective. If you're, and if you're perspective, you're sort of hijacking that in the way that like, for example, like 
fruit hijack uh, fruit-eating animals in order to spread their seed, <laughs> as an example. So here's um, some more tech state-of-the-art stuff. So this is an example of uh, formal semantics of what, what I call smart transitions. So smart transitions is sort of like an idea that comes from smart transactions. It sort of generalizes it to like all sorts of different computer science. Um, this is like a, a system for describing um, distributed systems that I'm doing all this notation in. There's going to be a paper released about this. should have been today, but it's going to be like tomorrow or maybe the next day, like latest. Um, so like, look out for this. It's going to be, it's going to help you understand this. But basically, we have like a, a labeled state transition message production system, V, and then I can define another one, R, which has these special operations, duplicate, speculate, and validate, which is going to do basically a speculative execution of this other system in order to see in the future whether the thing that happened was supposed to happen, and then validate basically the current transition based on like what happens many transitions down in the future, sort of violating normal transition semantics in a very, very interesting way, which I call smart. Um, and basically, they, the, the idea is like they can sort of look into the future. But in general, um, you know, far and wide, all over the place. So basically, here's like the transitions. So let's just like go over through them quickly. Duplicate takes a state, creates two copies of the state. If you try to duplicate an already duplicated state, it does nothing. Uh, speculate basically only works on duplicated states, otherwise it does nothing. This, when, it, on its, when it's on a duplicated state, what it'll do is it'll apply the transition with this label L and this message M to the second state. So the original state is left untouched, and the second state is updated to the new state, and then it outputs like a message in this like little temporary buffer zone um, from that transition. And so like it collects these messages uh, and updates the state while it's speculating, and then you can do a validate transition, which will either do one of two things. One of them is it'll it'll delete the speculative execution state, or it'll delete the current like current state, like the old state. And so the, when you do this validate step, it's like a few transitions later, at least one transition later. And then based on the validity of that transition, you sort of either revert all the previous transitions or you sort of choose them. You sort of collapse this superposition of like the old state and the new state and you just get the new state. So this sort of is a speculative execution transition system based on like a one transition system. And basically the amazing thing about this is that you can sort of implement Ethereum out of gas semantics sort of like just with this. Basically, you charge an account gas, you do a bunch of execution speculatively thinking they won't run out of gas. If they run out of gas, you throw out all those changes and you go back to that just after the charge state. And sort of, you can use this to like justify actually that Ethereum transactions are already sort of smart just with respect to the out of gas exception that is that the block is aware of on this sort of block limit uh, transaction uh, limit sort of uh, um, level. I mean the block, I mean it might be the validator or something, you know. And so basically, but this idea of like validating based on what happens in the future uh, sort of it can be done much, much more widely than just out of gas. You can just sort of refine those validity checks to add whatever constraints you want. Um, you know, you could, you could have, you know, more than this amount of MEV, like better than this performance as you revert, et cetera. And the nice thing about this is sort of, okay, that was one speculative execution, but we do the same thing where we do many, many, many speculative executions where and then this could sort of very well encode uh, an MEV search where basically you're just trying a lot of different possibilities and then you can validate based on the whole search whether you'll do any of those transitions and which one you'll do. And that's sort of like extremely powerful semantics. Um, but that's just looking forward. I mean, like, and this stuff really can look back and a different alternative presence either also, which is sort of, it's sort of a trip. And it sort of really, really helped me get intuition for quantum mechanics randomly. Um, anyways, so use cases, challenges, and implications. There's, there's stuff from the slides I haven't read. I'm trying to really rush through this, um, but some of it is going to come back up now, I realize. So basically, there's a bunch of stuff that's useful for. First, I'm going to stress again the infrastructure and the way that it's pulling itself by the bootstraps by like using transactions to make transaction infrastructure. Um, and then also all the, all blockchain use cases. I'm trying to say this is this is like totally dominant paradigm um, where basically like no matter what you think of, you can do it more efficiently with smart transactions, except for maybe a simple send. Maybe jury's out. It's pro probably more efficient with smart transactions, anyways. Um, but it's going to be more like a smart trans smart operation or something like that. So basically, long story short, or, I mean, here's a, bunch of here's a bunch of things. Oh, you know, we have these access control lists, lists that don't really work because like, you sort of might get outside of them and then you still have to execute the transaction and then you just, get a, you just get less of a discount if it doesn't work. It's like sort of a weird hack. It'd be nice, and we can do this, uh, to have access control lists that actually work without having to do any code analysis to prove that they work. 
you just sort of try it, and if it doesn't work, revert. It's great. Validation is amazing. Um, we can save gas and pay without ETH. This is sort of like classic stuff for MEV, but the way that it's done in smart transactions is a little more capital efficient, maybe a lot more capital efficient in some cases. Um, rent as expected MEV to justify state and RAM. This is sort of an interesting thing. We have a like, long problem in Ethereum about state rent and statelessness and how will people have the state, why will they know, to how will they validate my transaction like now, like how will they search it? And the answer is like, oh, if you have enough, if they expect enough MEV, they, they, they'll store it and they'll speculate on that in all sorts of ways. Maybe they'll even do it in a way that's sort of like public value as opposed to internalized value. And so basically, um, rent actually comes in through the back door, not through smart transactions, but like MEV in general. But I think smart transactions in particular, because it's sort of, they can be MEV, they can be rent aware in a way that's sort of like a function of what is happening on the searcher's RAM and what the searcher's policy is for what they choose to put in their RAM. And so it can be like sort of very specific um, and, ve and very flexible compared to like all the, men all the rent proposals so far. Automated collective bargaining, pretty cool, right? You have a bunch of transactions with a bunch of people in your little union, and you decide, hey, we're not going to transact unless the, we're all treated good. Very, very good, very, very good stuff. You know, we'll get that. We'll 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 get those beasts from the dark forest. Get our meth back. Um, um, direct economic interventions at the, all scales. This is very, very cool. You can basically use macro statistics, micro statistics, meso statistics, and like just pay for those outcomes in a sort of very direct way that's sort of lacking today in like public policy, where basically like Helicopter Ben has a really hard time dropping money on people. Um, but like sort of we see all the transactions on all the timelines like collapsed into one and sort of like can pay the searchers to, for whatever policy goal we want. It's amazing. Um, just in time, liquidity pools, it's pretty cool. Imagine the liquidity follows the different trades within your transaction around just to serve you better. Amazing can happen today because of the, the transaction uh, timing uh, and the operation timing doesn't allow for it. Um, zero capital, zero credit trading. This is very cool. Where you can do time travel to borrow profits from the future to do your trade now. You wouldn't think, but totally possible in Ethereum today already, um, uh, but just within the scope of a single transaction. In the future, it'll be across many transactions because you know, a, a, an atomic block happens all at the same time, which means that the end of the block happens the same as the time as the start of the block, which means you can sort of borrow the profit from the end of the block at the start of the block and sort of have it all work out. Uh, amazing, amazing. Um, you can hedge, quote unquote, using exactly the costs that are incurred at the end of the block. It's not even really hedging because you know for sure the cost. It's like the most efficient it could possibly be for certain instruments and lots of other stuff. But we have challenges still. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this can be very, very computationally expensive. Simultaneously searching for all these solutions at the same time for all these transactions, especially if everyone's demanding them, you know, there's a lot of them. Uh, it can be very hard. Who knows how the complexity grows in the smart transactions? It depends on what they're doing. I could definitely design smart transactions that do really bad um, for the searchers and that basically don't have solutions the more you add to them. Like, you know, you, they might have solutions tractably for a few, but then like the big O is so bad, like you add 10 more and then you, just, you, just, you can't solve them anymore. And this is why this DOS and gas insurance market is so important because like you kind of need to, they kind of need to figure out like, is this a DOS attack? Is this a legitimate smart transaction? Is it something that is going to have a solution or is this something that we're wasting our search on in or, because um, it's just computationally very difficult to find all these solutions. Also, you know, I mentioned all these kind of counterfactual stats and claims and things. Sir, the searcher knows that, but like why should your transaction trust the searcher to give it the right values? Like there are sort of like challenge, challenges with respect to verifying um, these, these inputs, um, especially efficiently. Um, and then there's a multi-block issue, which is sort of like actually we wouldn't, we don't want in some way transactions to like end in one block to finish, to just finish validating everything in one block. It's sort of very nice to have multi-block transactions. And to do this efficiently is a challenge, especially composed with all the other search. So rather than all the searches being sort of like this block, imagine if you have searches on different timelines, um, sort of uh, for different transactions that are executing on different timelines. So, and also there's a whole search organization problem around this, like how do you organize the searches actually? So basically, but like very, very interestingly, the, this sort of has actually a lot of implications beyond the sort of birthplace of these transactions as sort of, you know, this MEV space where basically, you know, you're responding to this MEV search uh, because actually like the smart transaction validation is sort of 
very wide. It doesn't need to be validating anything to do with MEV. And this sort of useful in distributed systems in a broad way, in, in transactional systems in a very broad way. Uh, and so actually smart transactions are sort of not just MEV. MEV is sort of, you know, like an economic thing. It's like only one side of the story. They also have really amazing computer science innovations. Not that the economic stuff isn't great. I mean, the risk management that smart transactions do, like that hedging that I was talking about earlier, amazing. Basically, can really, really make things much more economically efficient. And then sort of like um, legally, if you will, uh, it's very low liability to hire, quote unquote, uh, or, or to be a virtual service provider because you're not a real service provider. And, and so you're just extracting money. You're just being sort of a selfish maximizer, which means that you're limited in liability. So basically, unfortunately, out of time, this is my concluding slide. Um, and they're missing a will there. Oh no, they do, re they do actually revolutionize now Ethereum's transactional semantics. And sort of like, that's like sort of, um, you know, the prophecy and like sort of like the fact in the future, which is sort of like, I guess what a prophecy should do. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it. I have more. I have more. Come, come see me later. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vlad. Uh, sadly, there's no more time for questions, but I'm sure he's going to answer uh, all your questions over here. Um, yeah, outside. The, outside. Yeah, outside. <laughs> uh, outside. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.